Hey friends, it's me, Emma again, and welcome back to my channel where we talk about all things sinister. If you are interested in true crime or if you like all things horror related, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. That way you can join me for some morbid conversation. Now for today's chat, we are going to be traveling internationally yet again, and that's because we are going to go to New Zealand to talk about New Zealand's youngest convicted murderer. And that's because on April 15th, 2012, Jordan Nelson was only 13 years old when he took the life of Rosemary Kurth. Jordan had been living with Kurth, and she had an almost grandmotherly role to him, despite the fact that they weren't actually related. She was the girlfriend of Carrie Locke, who had previously dated Jordan's biological grandmother. Though Carrie wasn't related to Jordan by blood, he had raised Jordan and loved him as his own even after he and Jordan's grandmother split up. Jordan's biological parents were both alive, though the relationship with either of them wasn't stable. Restraining orders and child, youth, and family services would keep him separated from his parents more often than not, and it was actually CYF that had placed Jordan with Carrie Locke rather than putting him into foster care. What I'm getting at is Carrie Locke had raised Jordan from such a young age, from a baby, that he had taken on a fatherly role to Jordan. And when he started dating Rosemary, she had taken on a motherly role to Jordan. She was proud of him when he had great achievements, but when he misbehaved, she also put him in his place. She would ground him from things. She would make him apologize when he wronged others and stepped up to take care of the boy the way a paternal figure would. Now, no one in this family's life thought that they had any issues within this family unit of three. Sure, Jordan's biological parents were not the greatest family unit, but as far as him, Carrie, and Rosemary... Nobody saw any issues with this group. Jordan had your typical teenage rebellion where he misbehaved. He was suspended from school once for coming to school high, smoking a little bit of pot, and he got into normal teenage mischief. But it didn't seem like there was an overwhelming problem within the home outside of what you would see in a normal teenager's home. It was nothing really all that concerning. However, despite the family appearing to be relatively normal outside of a little mischief, early one Sunday morning in April, while Carrie Locke was out walking his dogs, Jordan Nelson would take the 22 caliber rifle that Carrie had kept on hand for farm use, and he would take that rifle out of the home and into like a little outdoor dwelling, like a little shed outside. And he would store the gun out in this little building alongside some ammunition. Later on that day, once again, when Carrie Locke was outside, this time doing some farm chores, Jordan would go to this shed and he would retrieve the gun. He would take the gun and the ammunition back inside the home. He would go to the dining room where Rosemary Kurth was working on a puzzle. He would point the gun to the back of her head, pull the trigger, and kill her instantly. After putting a bullet in her head, he would drag her body to her bedroom and leave her there on the floor. He would then go to his grandfather's room and ransack the room looking for money. He would take a little bit of money from his grandfather's room, and he would grab Rosemary's car keys as he headed out the door. He would end up getting in Rosemary's car and taking off. Now, Carrie Locke had seen the car leave the home, and he just assumed that it was his girlfriend Rosemary because it was her car. He hadn't heard the gunshot, and he didn't know there was anything wrong. Later on, when he was done with his chores outside, he would go back inside the home and he would actually start to call out for Jordan. And it would be within a few moments that he would make it to the dining room where he would see the bloody mess that Jordan had left behind. 
He would follow the drag marks from the dining room to Rosemary's bedroom, where he would find his girlfriend lying there on the floor. He would immediately call emergency services, and he knew right away that Jordan was likely responsible, and he told emergency services that exact speculation. Jordan would end up being pulled over in Rosemary's car, and he would be arrested around 3.45 that afternoon. Originally, when Jordan was arrested, he had claimed sort of like having amnesia. He said he couldn't remember what he had done. He couldn't remember what had happened. He just knew something bad had happened, and he was on his way to the police station. After some time, he would end up dropping the act, and he would admit to what he had done. On November 15th, 2012, Jordan would end up pleading guilty to murder. There are a few reasons that people have interpreted as far as motive, from him not being allowed to go visit his mother, to Rosemary giving him a hard time, to being grounded from TV. He had even told police when they picked him up that she had been pretty shitty to him. Jordan would have his sentencing hearing the following month, and on December 20th, he was sentenced to 18 years, eligible for parole after six years. Typically, cases like this one would involve a mandatory life sentence, but seeing as how Jordan had just barely turned 13 when he had committed the crime, the judge thought that a mandatory life sentence was excessive in this case. So this ruling and this sentencing ended up being a really big disappointment to Rosemary's family. They said that this sentencing would set a horrible precedent for any future cases. Typically, cases like this in New Zealand have a mandatory life sentence. And knowing that he could get out as early as six years after the crime was committed did not feel like justice was served in their mind. Rosemary left behind three adult children and three grandchildren. These people would grow up without their mother and without their grandmother. And her murderer could be out as early as six years. Jordan was 19 years old before he first became eligible for parole in 2018. He went before the parole board and originally he was denied his parole. And this is because the parole board thought that he was a medium to high risk of violently reoffending. They did say that he was doing really well within the prison system. He had gone from like a combative, angsty, and troubled teenager too courteous and receptive and more mature as an adult. However, they did think that he did need more severe, um, intense psychological counseling before they thought he would be ready to reintegrate into society. And so his parole was denied. He would go up for parole again in 2020 at 21 years old. And this time they had seen enough progress within Jordan that they agreed that he would be eligible for parole within certain conditions. One of those conditions is that he wear an ankle monitor and be monitored rather than obviously having free reign. And the second condition would be that he would be forbidden from purchasing or owning any firearms or any kind of explosive weaponry. And so with this being said, Jordan did end up being released, and he was released when he was 21 years old in December of 2020, just before Christmas. So while it was a very Merry Christmas for him, I am sure, Rosemary's family were likely very disappointed in the release. He didn't get the minimum time of six years, but he only served about eight years before being back into society. And I'm sure that that felt like too short of a period for them. I'm really curious on what other people think as far as sentencing of child murderers go. I do agree that life in prison for a 13-year-old is probably a little excessive. 
But is it reasonable that they're eligible for parole after six years? Is it reasonable that he got out after eight years after taking someone's life for absolutely no real reason? Now, obviously, he met the qualifications with his psychiatrist and with his therapist that he mentally is no longer a threat. It's not like they consider him to be a sociopath or a psychopath. But they didn't think Edmund Kemper was a sociopath or a psychopath either. And they released him after he ended up killing his grandparents after a very young age. And then he grew up and went on to be the co-ed killer where he killed multiple college age girls before ending up killing his mother and his mother's friend. So I don't know. I mean, it's such a unique situation. You don't often have children killing people. So how do you handle it when they do? I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Make sure to put your comments down below. And thank you for joining me for today's chat. If this is the kind of content that you're into, like I say, stay subscribed to the channel. Make sure your post notification bell is turned on. And then that way you'll be notified the next time I sit down here for another morbid chat. And until that next time, my friends, like I always say, take care, stay safe, and I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye.